Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, market watchers have a welcome prediction for this year's fertilizer prices. In southern gardening, the dazzling dianthus, sometimes called pinks, they deliver great winter color. And the food factor, juicing, find out the basics of this way to add nutrition to your diet. In the markets this week, a key destination for U.S. egg exports is lost, at least for a while, as the fundamental outlook for wheat prices appears weak in light of the new USDA numbers. In the feature segment, the nation's beef herd is at its smallest point in more than 60 years. Replacements are in demand, but heifers from Missouri's Show Me Select program are worth even more. From last year, and in anticipation of... You know, we, we started out with this program just to make a, a little extra money on as far as selling bred heifers, but it has just, it's turned our whole cow herd around because, you know, through AI and, and being able to, to get better genetics. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Fertilizer prices are up slightly from a year ago, but market watchers are recommending that farmers hold off buying at this time. Artist Farm Journal Magazine is reporting there could actually be some downside ahead for fertilizer prices. One of the reasons, as you might guess, is the price of oil. Ag economist Greg Ibendahl with Kansas State says the decline in oil prices could bring about a decline in fertilizer prices. Barry Ward of Ohio State says as of late December, fertilizer prices were slightly higher than a year ago. He looks for the traditional price patterns to operate this year, such as an increase in the late winter as farmers begin to buy for spring. Overall, he looks for relatively flat prices this year. Projected lower crop prices may cut back on farmer demand, thereby forcing dealers to trim their prices to make fertilizer sales. Monday, while I was in Laurel, Mississippi, I noticed regular gasoline was selling for $1.86 per gallon. The decrease in crude oil prices is benefiting many across the nation, but it's hurting the oil industry and those businesses that supply it. Last June, when crude oil was bringing more than $100 per barrel, U.S. employers added 267,000 new workers to their payrolls. Six months later, with oil below $50, hopes are rising that hiring will increase significantly in the days ahead. From more affordable prices at the pump to lower utility bills, consumers and businesses are enjoying substantial savings on fuel, and the Energy Department estimates that lower gasoline prices will save U.S. households about $550 this year. That means more people can splurge on purchases from clothing and appliances to vacations and dining. Increased spending is expected to prompt some businesses to step up hiring, which would circulate even more money through the economy. Cheaper gasoline is also alleviating the dreaded threat of inflation. Lower prices limit yields on U.S. Treasuries, which in turn help the housing industry by keeping a lid on mortgage rates. But make no mistake, Plummeting energy prices clearly do not benefit everyone. Increased domestic energy production has been an important source of job growth for the past five years. It still constitutes a relatively small percentage of America's total labor force, but principal global investors estimates that increased production accounted for an average of 3,600 new jobs per month since 2010. Now with crude prices hovering near a five and a half year low, oil and gas producers are laying off portions of their workforce. Payroll processor ADP reported that the mining industry, which includes oil and gas drilling, shed about 2,000 jobs in December. And the downturn is rippling into other sectors of the economy. 
U.S. Steel, for example, blamed falling oil prices for its plan to lay off 750 workers who make tubing for the energy sector. Juicing has become a popular and easy way for people to get their daily requirements of fruits and vegetables. But where do you start? Well, in this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State Extension Service shows us what juicing is all about. Many of us are determined to eat more fruits and vegetables this year. Juicing is a popular way to get your essential daily requirements. In general, adults should consume two cups of fruits and three cups of vegetables per day, ideally from a combination of whole foods and juices. A juicing machine works by grinding up the fruits and vegetables, the skin, seeds, and core. Unfortunately, Juicing leaves behind the pup, which has many valuable nutrients and fiber. For a creative way to use leftover pup, try adding it to soups, muffins, and meatloaf for extra nutrients. Before you start to juice, wash all produce. Make just enough juice to drink in a day or two. Fresh juice can quickly grow harmful bacteria if left out at room temperature. So refrigerate all leftovers immediately. If you are interested in trying a fresh juice drink without buying an expensive juicer, look for local restaurants or specialty stores that serve juices. Here's your treat broth. Would you like the straw? Thank you. It looks great. For more tips, follow us on Pinterest at Mississippi State University Extension Service. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says to remember, juicing is not a substitution for eating fruits and vegetables. Many homeowners believe that pansies are the only source of winter color. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bogman shows us how the dianthus can also give your landscape a colorful punch this time of year. A garden challenge is maintaining a variety of color in the cool season landscape. Dianthus will keep your garden interesting and is a good choice for that extra splash of color. Dianthus are some of my favorite flowering annuals with their variety of pinks, whites, and purples. For the very best flowering, Dianthus should be planted at the same time you would pansies. The small round flower can be single or arranged in loose clusters. I really enjoy taking a close look at these flowers. The individual petals have a fringed or serrated edge and a dainty floral and delicate fragrance. A good frost resistant selection is the ideal select dianthus group. Bright green leaves contrast well with clusters of brightly colored lacy edged flowers. The ideal select mix offers flowers in many colors and patterns. And I particularly like the ideal select red with its bright and bold flowers. Super Parfait Dianthus are indeed super and cold weather tolerant. This group is known for their compact size and large two to two and a half inch diameter blossoms. Super Parfait Raspberry has gorgeous pinkish white flowers with crimson streaked petals and a dark eye. The large Super Parfait Red Peppermint flowers are bright white with a red center eye. And since we're looking at Dianthus, I have to recommend an old standby, Telstar Purple Picote. Telstar will be 8 to 10 inches tall and wide and will tolerate cooler temperatures. Be creative with cool season combination plantings. Dianthus is a great combination with Red Giant Mustard. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Late in the Dianthus, it comes in perennial and uh, annual varieties. It's also an adaptable plant. It can grow from zones four through 10. Mm. In our feature setting today, see how Missouri cattlemen are helping themselves by raising quality replacement heifers through the Show Me Select program. Time now for the markets with Layton, and you say organic crops are seen as a way to diversify in some areas? That's right. Grain prices may make some farmers consider it maybe more than in the past. That story coming up here. Also ahead in the markets, there's one surprise for the corn sector in the crop reports. Cotton prices are described by one analyst as just treading water. 
as China shuts out U.S. eggs and chicken, an official ban is now in effect. This week began with the government's monthly crop report and supply and demand estimates. Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley says there was one strange aspect in the corn numbers. We talked about that as well as the soybean data on Tuesday. Well, John Michael, we have a record corn crop according to the government. Definitely. Uh, still, on pace, still on pace to be a record corn crop, even though it was a little bit smaller than uh, analysts expected coming into the report. Uh, actually, the strange thing is that they, they pulled the, the yield down a little bit. Down uh, was 173, currently projected at 171. I think all the analysts were expecting a, a reduction in total harvested acres, and that's where but uh, the expectation was for a reduction in, in total production, but the, the surprise was in the fact that it came through the yield, not through the harvested acres, but still on pace to be a record, a record level of, of pr corn production in the U.S. Uh, pull that down through the, through the balance sheet, you look at demand, demand was tweaked a little bit, but uh, overall ending stocks much smaller than, uh, than they were in December, and then much smaller than an analyst expected, which that, that turned into a good day for corn following the report. So how has the market reacted uh, as we sit here on Tuesday talking about this? Well, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot for the market to digest. You had corn and soybeans really going in two different directions, and typically those are joined at the hip, and they like to move together. So whenever you get a report that's one way for one and another for, for beans, it, it puts market participants in a bit of a, a state of uh, uncertainty. And right. so the market was all over the board yesterday, but I think at the, at the, at the final close, corn was higher and, and beans were a little bit lower. All right, you mentioned soybeans, uh, kind of building some drama there, but what, what did the report say about the soybeans? Well, we saw uh, a larger ending stock number than what was expected. Uh, again, I think the market was looking for some changes that didn't really occur, and as a result, ending stocks were left unchanged when the market was looking for a slight reduction there, and therefore kind of the opposite effect of what we saw with corn. So uh, that, that put, uh, put the market a bit on edge there and brought, brought soybean prices down just a little bit. Are those prices expected to to trend lower given the numbers as far as soybeans or we have to wait and see uh, what, what You happens. know, we, right now, I mean, everybody's looking at 2015, you know, we're trying to get 2014 behind us, but uh, I think it is going to, to continue to p potentially do some damage to the market. Uh, I think most of it's been digested at this point, um, but it, it, will be, it will be something that we continue to, uh, to, to dig into uh, deeper moving forward. And I guess as we get uh, a little further here into the winter, the decisions about crop and uh, what's going to be planted and not planted, this report will, of course, factor into that. That's right. I think we got a lot, still have a lot of bean and, beans and corn in storage. And so depending on how that comes out of, of storage, will uh, definitely impact prices moving into planting. In some parts of the country, growing organic food may become more attractive. The Des Moines Register reports that low corn and soybean prices may prompt some farmers to look at organic production as one way to boost their bottom line. One main downside, though, is that producers must make changes to their land, such as ending the use of pesticides. Then there is a waiting period of three years before a farmer can receive the certified organic accreditation. Well, in that crop report Monday, U.S. ending stocks for wheat were larger than last month. The USDA also raised world wheat production and ending stocks. Analyst Elaine Cubb says the latest numbers were just another confirmation of the bearish fundamental outlook for wheat. So I think just looking at the chart, you could see that benchmark Chicago contract continue falling another dollar before it would hit the lows from September. And because there, it has been divorced from the row crops at this point, and it may continue to experience pressure from the U.S. dollar, we don't know that the dollar is at a high by any means at this point, I think it certainly could continue falling. DTN reports cotton futures tick slightly lower at midweek. Dwayne Howell says they were still stuck, though, within Monday's trading range established prior to the release of the new monthly USDA reports. Another analyst, Don Shirley of Georgia, describes cotton as just treading water right now. Shirley says that Monday's numbers are being interpreted as somewhat negative to the cotton fiber market. Our trivia quiz this week is about cattle. The U.S. is one of the top two beef producing countries in the world. This brings us to the quiz question, what country is the second one that is a top beef producer? Is the answer A, Canada, B, Brazil, C, Argentina, or D, Russia? I'll have that answer at the end of the markets. We're going to pause for a short break on farm week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span will update us on cattle prices. He says China has banned all U.S. poultry imports. In the feature segment today, would you like to have a calving window that lasts two weeks? It's possible with Missouri's Show Me Select program.
Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed when farm tractors overturn. Don't become a statistic. Avoid rollovers by staying away from steep ditches and pond banks. Slow down and operate tractors at a safe angle to the slope of the terrain. Always keep loader buckets low when transporting materials and inspect the work area for obstacles such as stumps, holes, or washes. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The 2015 Delta Ag Expo will take place Wednesday and Thursday, January 21st and 22nd. Location is the Bolivar County Expo Center in Cleveland. Managing profitability with low commodity prices is this year's theme. There will be more than 100 commercial exhibitors on hand. In addition to the regular commodity information sessions, there will be an ag drone demonstration by one exhibitor. Methods for controlling wild hogs will also be covered. The annual meeting of the Northeast Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association takes place Thursday and Friday, February 12th and 13th. Location is the Lee County Agri Center on Highway 145 at Verona. The educational conference will feature producers speaking about their experiences. Commercial exhibitors will be on hand as well. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. China has banned U.S. poultry and egg exports because of avian influenza. The bird flu was reportedly found in non-commercial flocks in Washington and Oregon last month. The USA Poultry and Egg Export Council says China's ban affects live chicks and hatching eggs as well as poultry and eggs. The council does note that the bird flu outbreaks are nowhere near the major U.S. commercial poultry regions of the U.S. China is, of course, a key export market for U.S. chicken, turkey, and duck products. Last year, the exports to China from this sector topped $270 million. Well, in the cattle sector this week, there seemed to be more uncertainty. One main question revolves around how much underlying support can develop through the rest of January. And let's Virgil Robinson sum the market situation up this way. The recent decline um I think has improved the economics to some extent. One of two things must, have, ha, must happen over the next six months. Either Fed prices have to get stronger or feeder prices and grain prices weaker. Right now, my best opinion would be over the next six months, Fed cattle prices will remain here or higher. Before our new feature story, let's check the trivia answer for this week. The correct choice is B. The U.S. and Brazil are the top two beef producing countries in the world. Our feature story today takes us to Missouri where a statewide program is working to increase the quality of that state's replacement heifers. Show Me Select plays off the state's well-known motto. With more than 100,000 heifers enrolled, Market to Market's Paul Yeager says many Missouri cattlemen are believers. Some herds have shortened their calving season to only two weeks. This story first aired on Farm Week last summer. America's cattle herd is smaller than it has been in 63 years, but the number of young females being kept for breeding is on the rise. The Agriculture Department reports the nation's farmers and ranchers kept nearly five and a half million beef heifers for breeding this year, up nearly 100,000 from last year. And in anticipation of rebounding cattle numbers, a handful of states have added or are planning Heifer improvement programs such as one began 17 years ago in Missouri. You know, we're, we're at a very fortunate time relative to having the program in place given where the cattle industry is at and the demand for heifers because there's going to be significant demand for uh, good quality replacement heifers. In the early 1990s, Patterson established a single county program in Kentucky where cattle producers were worried about low pregnancy rates and calving difficulty among their heifers. You know, now it would seem to be a fairly simplistic set of requirements that more or less encompassed everything from the time a heifer was weaned from her mother on up through her first breeding season and then subsequent, uh, subsequently. 
Patterson believed the University of Missouri Extension's statewide network of livestock specialists would make a larger scale effort possible. So a few years later, he brought the concept with him to the number two beef cattle producing state, setting up the Missouri Show Me Select Replacement Heifer Program. We eliminate heifers right up front that aren't going to succeed. Some of the top um, cattle econ economists will say it takes us five or six years to pay for a heifer. Heifers remaining in the program are eligible to be sold at Show Me Select auctions. In November and December of 2013, bred heifers in those sales sold for an average of more than $2,100. Heifers in Oklahoma City, the location the federal government uses to track breeding stock sale prices, brought an average of $1,287 or $900 less. University of Missouri ag economist Scott Brown says the comparison isn't perfect because the federal government doesn't track prices for breeding stock as closely as those of market steers and heifers. But he believes the data from multiple years does point to some added value. Also, comparing Show Me Select heifers with those not in the program reveals how artificial insemination, or AI, and better genetics can increase average sale prices anywhere from 7 to 22%. In the beef industry, we're looking at about 10% or less of the cattle in the beef industry are artificially inseminated every year, which is extremely low compared to other um, nations, other, uh, and even other sectors within the U.S. The dairy industry is almost strictly AI, and we've still been slow to implement it in the beef industry. Many of the enrolled Missouri farms, 115 as of fall of 2013, kept show me heifers for their own herds. That's the case at Crooks Farms near Leeton, Missouri, where three families are involved in the cattle business. You know, we, we started out with this program just to make a, a little extra money on as far as selling bred heifers, but it has just, it's turned our whole cow herd around because, you know, through AI and, and being able to, to get better genetics. The program's heifers must have pelvic bones of a certain width and height a mature reproductive system, and have received certain vaccinations. At Crooks Farms, this year's 125 heifers were run through a chute for the usual vaccinations, as well as a pre-breeding exam. The cattle are run through at least four more times for placing and later removing implants that regulate progesterone levels, optional artificial insemination, and one or two pregnancy checks. It works for some producers, it doesn't work for other producers because it's uh, a lot of extra work, but then uh, when they go to sell them, they get a lot more uh, value added there. The program prompts cattle producers to add practices they might not have otherwise. At Crooks Farms, they not only added artificial insemination to give themselves more options for sires, but also began implanting the progesterone devices known as CEDARS, or Controlled Internal Drug Release Inserts, to synchronize their heifers' reproductive cycles. As a result, most heifers will be fertile around the same time, and as a group, they calve within a narrower time span. When they was bull bred, we was up 45, 60 days at 2 o'clock every night. Somebody was checking the heifers. Now we've got them grouped to where that's a 10, 12, 14 day period and then we've kind of got a slack time. Statistics suggest those heifers in the program are less likely to need assistance calving. If we look at national data, typically first calf heifers have an assistance rate of 25 to 30 percent. In our Show Me Select program, we have that pulled that down into that 8, 9, 10 percent of assistance rates. Hiring a veterinarian or AI technician to work on the heifers, as well as the per animal fees, can create new expenses. But beef experts not involved in the program understand why it could lead to a financial gain. Less than two years ago, Missouri's Show Me Select spun off a related program, Quality Beef by the Numbers, to track how steers born from the program's females are doing when it comes to meat quality.
we want to trace those animals from conception to carcass. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. You can watch this story on Show Me Select on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on our Farm Week USA Facebook page and YouTube. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the original story as well as read the script. We're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. Now, Leighton, one thing about it, that two-week calving cycle, that's high intensive management. They're doing AI, no bull breeding. But it does show what you can do if you're willing to put in the labor to make it happen. Right. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, the Great Mississippi Tea Company. This Brookhaven-based farm planted its first bushes last year. It plans to produce high-quality organic teas. In the Food Factor, find out the best snacks for runners. It's all about timing. And in Southern Gardening, microgreens. They're easy to grow, pretty, and quite nutritious. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.